It's time for security now. Steve Gibson is here. He's going to debunk that whole RSA secure ID broken thing and then talk about buffering and how we can fix buffer bloat. There's a technology, I kid you not, called Coddle. Stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 359, recorded June 27th, 2012, Coddling Our Buffers. Security Now is brought to you by Ford, featuring the My Ford Mobile smartphone app for electric vehicles. The My Ford Mobile app makes the electric driving experience fun and efficient. Learn more about Ford electric vehicle technologies at Ford.com slash technology. And by GoToAssist from Citrix. Take control of your IT world from one simple cloud-based platform. Provide live or unattended support to all your users anywhere. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today at GoToAssist.com. Use the promo code SECURITY. It's time for Security Now. Ready to cover your privacy and security needs with this man right here, our explainer-in-chief, Mr. Steve Gibson of GRC.com. Com. Steve, good to see you again. We just uh, finished. We're a little late today because we just finished our live coverage of day one of the Google I.O. conference, the developers conference. You know, yeah. do you go to developers conferences? I mean, Microsoft has them. Apple has them. Google has them. Back in the day, I used to. I used to go up to um, uh, Redmond and hang out with Google stuff. I mean, with with, with Microsoft yeah, back in the I've day, been to a and, few of those, yeah. and of course, every Comdex that there was, I used to do breakfast with uh, Philippe Kahn. He would always invite me up, and and I'd go to parties and see, you know, Steve and Bill uh, from Microsoft, and uh, and hang out. But uh, you know, and I, I did go famously to the RSA Security Conference a few years ago, where I ran across Stina yeah, Evans Fard yeah, yeah. of Yubico and found the YubiKey. But in general, my my sense is I can I can look at the uh, the schedules of the conferences. I can pick up the keynotes. I can I can look at the PDFs. You know, read the research at length. Um, which, as for example, what I did for our podcast today, uh, several months ago, when the term buffer bloat was in the news, we did a podcast about buffer bloat. We're, we'll review that briefly today because I want to explain the operation of the solution. <laughs> which some fabulous uh, internet architects and designers have designed. And, I mean, it, it's like, okay, now we just need it deployed. And that's the next step. But essentially, they've come up with a really, really nice solution, which, which is really interesting to have when we look at how – how hard it has been for the industry to have something. I mean, this this issue of how to deal with routing buffers on the internet is as old as packet switching because it's a problem that arises from that. And it has fought every prior attempt to wrestle it to the ground until now. We have a solution. And then the big news of the week, we don't really have that much news, but the big news that got, unfortunately picked up and completely blown out of proportion is, and I, I heard you mentioning it yeah, yesterday or Monday, I guess it must have been yesterday, about this, uh, the scientists so-called, you know, cracking the RSA secure ID tokens that, you know, Ars Technica picked up on it. I got tweeted from like I, I by everybody. You, I knew you'd cover it. Yep. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So we, we have that to talk about. And uh, and just random tidbits and things. I uh, I also have the not yet published next book by Mark Rasunovich that uh, that we'll talk about that I have just finished. Good. I just got uh, Daniel Suarez's new book. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we we can compare notes. 
But before we do that, I would like to briefly talk a little bit about uh, one of our sponsors, the great folks at Ford. Uh, Ford is a, a company that is, uh, you know, I think Ford should do some keynotes, some Google I.O. or Apple style keynotes. They certainly have a lot to talk about. They have an interesting story. In fact, I went to an event in uh, Silicon Valley at the uh, Computer History Museum last week uh, where Ford was announcing the opening of its Silicon Valley uh, offices because they want to reach out to technology gurus, mavens, uh, programmers, and get them to develop for a new platform, your Ford vehicle. They're, they think of this as a platform, and I love it. The 2012 Ford Focus is a case in point. This is their brand-new electric vehicle, the most fuel-efficient five-passenger vehicle in America, and it has an API. <laughs> I love that. You can't have a platform without an API, and uh, that's where Ford is reaching out to developers and saying, look, you can develop to our AppLink API lets you interact with the car and to demonstrate it they've created their my ford mobile app available on iphone android phones and blackberry phones my ford mobile is both a website and an app that help you i don't know take charge of your electric car T take a look at its state of charge where there are charging stations you can program charging uh, to a, a special, you know, least expensive time. It'll even tell you how much money you've saved and how much CO2 you haven't burned. You could There's leaderboards on the website so you can compete with others to save the planet. Um, it's just a really uh, neat idea. The go time is particularly interesting on this. You set a go time on your phone, which tells your car, look, I'm going to be getting in the car and uh, leaving uh, at uh, 8 this morning. I want you to make sure the car is all set up and uh, and seventy two degrees, and it will be, it'll be ready for you. It's kind of like a smart a smart car. It's it's very very cool stuff. Um, I I particularly like this as well. It, where is my car right now? <laughs> if you've ever if you've ever parked your car and forgotten where you left it, the My Ford Mobile app actually says, "Here's where your car is. Here's where nearest charging stations are. Let's plan the most eco friendly route." There's some gamification as well. I just love this. It is it is a really great beginning to what is is going to just get better and better all the time as Ford and developers update the capabilities of these vehicles. I have to say this is the way this is the way to look at a vehicle. It's a platform and Ford's doing it. That's a 21st century car company for you. Find out more at ford.com/technology or bring your smartphone to an EV certified Ford dealer. And you can test drive my Ford Mobile, the app, as well as the 2012 Ford Focus Electric. I think you're going to like it. Ford.com slash technology. All right, Steve, what's the story with the RSA tokens? I mean, that's a big deal if they've been cracked. Okay, yeah. Um, and they have not been. Oh. Yeah. But that's what so the headline said. I know, I know. Even Ars Technica, that I respect a lot and who often gets things correct, said Scient their headline was Scientists Crack, RSA Secure ID 800 Tokens Steal Cryptographic Keys, which is not at all true. In under 15 minutes. No? Yeah, no. okay. So here's the deal. Um, Bruce Schneier's famous quote is is fantastic. It applies here. He says, attacks only get better, they never get worse. Which reminds us that over time, academic researchers chip away at security. And we, we've talked about that in this seven and a half years of the podcast over and over and over. I mean, we, we highlight instances of that. Things like, for example, the the MD5 we were talking about recently, the, the Message Digest 5, the MD5 hash, where as researchers continued to look at it, they, they poked at it and, you know, began to find some soft spots. Well, there are standards associated with public key technology uh, asymmetric and all, and also symmetric key technology, which researchers have long known about. The annoying thing about the the paper that was that will be shown 
in August of 2012 at a major upcoming crypto conference is essentially an, an additional improvement on the, the efficiency of already known existing soft spots. So this, for example, is, is another reason that it's now time for us to be moving to 2048-bit asymmetric public key technology up from 1024 because, you know, the, the researchers are, are continuing to look at these problems and, and getting better at it. Now, way back in 98, so, you know, quite a while ago, there was a, a, a very sharp researcher um, uh, looks like I'm probably going to mispronounce his name. I, I, I would say Bleichenbacher um, came up with what was what which is sort of commonly known as the million probes attack. The idea is, of, and this is the idea both for the asymmetric public key attack and the symmetric attack, both of which were addressed in this paper that will be shown in in a month and a half. And that is, um, any crypto algorithm uh, that is in common use, the normal public key technology and symmetric key, they normally encrypt blocks of a certain size. For example, when we say, you know, AES encryption, that's it's a 128-bit block that has various key lengths. Uh, 128, 192, or 256 bit keys, but the block size is always 128. Well, what that means is that when we're encrypting data, it's going to be uncommon or unlikely. It's actually what one in 128 that the the actual length of our data would exactly fall into a multiple. Of the block size. So the question is, what do we do with the last block? And the solution is the cryptographers have come up with what's known as padding, where we we pad the data out to the size of the block. So it turns out that that the smart academics have figured out ways to get current state-of-the-art crypto systems to leak a little bit of information. And we've talked about some ways that happens, the so-called side channel attacks. For example, right now we understand the danger of a side channel. For example, if a crypto algorithm used a different amount of power depending upon the key that it was encrypting with, or if it took a different amount of time depending upon the key. Well, so those things that are like power or time that are not about the data going in and out, but they, they allow clever cryptographers and potentially bad guys, which is really the problem we're worried about, to, to glean some information. So that's what happened in this case, is back in 98, this million probes padding attack was demonstrated where where the padding used for public key crypto could be could be used in order to probe for the key the way this happens is you take something which has been encrypted and for example if you give it back to this algorithm to decrypt it and and you haven't altered it it'll say yeah fine here i decrypted it for you but if you if you deliberately damage the crypto the the encrypted data that you give it back to decrypt once it believes it's decrypted these algorithms check to make sure that the padding is correct sort of as a sort of a, a form of checksum and they may they will then respond whoops there seems to have been something wrong with with what you just gave me well that bit of feedback turns out to be very, very weak. That is, the systems are so good that cryptographers have thought about this a lot and looked at it. And it's like, oh, okay, you know, a million probes, 
you know, and then maybe with there's a statistical chance that we can learn something, so forth and so on. Okay, well, the efficiency of that was doubled in 2003 by a researcher, Kilma, and his group who were able to come up with an improvement. And then these guys, the subject of the authors of this paper and the subject of these news stories, made that attack essentially five times again more efficient so that so that today with with the with the actual technology in use RSA secure ID model 800 tokens the Estonia uh, you know uh, government wide secure ID card that has been issued um, and a number of of currently in use technologies in, as you said, Leo, in a, in what is now become a matter of minutes, it's, it's maybe, well, you know, RSA got, got hit because theirs was the fastest to crack. I think it was 13 minutes. Now we're not talking 13 lazy minutes. We're talking, you know, hard work, this is (laughs) hard working, high speed computer, so forth and so on minutes. Um, other of the systems are more like 90 minutes that there was there was I saw some 96 hours to do some things but still I mean that we're not we're no longer in millennia which is where we would like to be with our crypto but significantly neither have the keys been stolen all of the all of this is one particular instance of a of 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 a of a key that was used and encrypted can be determined. That is, the, the, all of this is about a, a hardware device that, and we've talked about HSMs, uh, Ubico has got one on the way, the hardware security module. The idea is because we've given up trying to secure our computers, we just can't, um, we've decided, okay, we will move the sensitive stuff out of RAM into a little hardware box and plug it in by USB or Firewire or whatever, and we'll ship the stuff out to it, have it do the work, and then it just kind of gives us the answer. But it's so basically they're creating a black box. So, um, so that's been the solution we've come up with because it's the only way we figured out we can secure anything. Is we, as I said, given up on on securing uh, the machines themselves. So what these attacks do is they would, they would, for example, as we have talked about, if you're encrypting a file, you generate a pseudo random key and then you, and, and, and that's fast for bulk encryption. Then you encrypt the file with that, but then you, encrypt just that key using public key technology, which is inherently slow. So you just encrypt the key that you used for encrypting the entire file. And that way you're able to, to minimize the amount of processing, but you have, you know, essentially the, the strength of, of, and, and flexibility of public key crypto without having to go so slowly. But this technology could allow them in a distressingly short period of time to figure out one key. That is, not crack the token, not get the sequence of numbers that it's going to generate, not have it reveal its own secret private key, but, but just probe it and, and poke it to get sort of like one answer. So what's most distressing is... These problems have been known for a decade. And in, in f- sort of following this trail back, I found the, the, the so-called PKCS number one standard. PKCS is public key cryptography standard on the RSA website. Um, de- and the, what everybody is using now is PKCS number one, version 1.5. And this is the By the way, that's what the crack is against, not against particularly the Secure ID token. 
Correct. It's just that it uses PKCS. Yes, and everybody does. It's a standards-based API that gives you, you know, inter-token interchangeability. The the RSA RSA folks were quick to point that out and saying that it's an academic exercise and not a useful attack. Does that seem fair to characterize it that way? Okay. Um, One of my favorite cryptographers besides Bruce said, uh, his name is Matthew Green, and, and I loved his quote about this. He said, never continue using a broken primitive only because the known attacks seem impractical right, today. Right, right, And so here's the point. PKCS version 2.1 was published on June 14th, 2002. Okay, we're at June 27th. 2012, the 2.1, actually 2.0 even, fixed this problem. Nobody moved. Nobody adopted it. For 10 years, Leo, this thing has been solved. But it's like, well, yeah, um, we know there's problems with 1.5, but... For the sake of backward compatibility, that's what we're going to support. Because And so, you know, okay, a decade ago, maybe it made sense. Here we are 10 years later, and nobody has moved off of 1.5. These attacks are only effective against that standard, not the new one. And, I mean, and all of this has been known. But the industry has been sitting around saying, well, there aren't any, exactly as you quoted RSA saying, there aren't any practical attacks. So, you know, and besides, we're selling lots of these. So we're not going to worry about it. So that's the story. Uh, um, the okay. good news is, you know, this, this, this is unfortunately, and we see this over and over and over. This is what, it's, what is required to get people to get off the dime. To, to update themselves, to, to keep themselves current. It's not until something bad like this happens. Well, it's exactly like Microsoft that last year finally stopped using the MD5 hash only last year. It was, that was the weakness that, that has allowed um, uh, Flame to get its foothold, was that, that there was a newfound means of doing a, a, a chosen prefix attack on the MD5 hash. Had Microsoft stopped using it back when all the cryptographers said stop using it, it's, you know, we no longer can trust MD5, that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have happened. So, so we have exactly that scenario again. Ten years old is the spec that completely shuts this down. Nobody's using it. So the good news is they're probably going to start now. So and, and, and there's nothing to fear right now because it isn't in the wild exactly. You, it's, um, Maybe it is now, I, I guess. Would, I would say if you were uh, – and, and, oh, and, and that's the other thing is that – so you know, the press ran around in a froth trying to figure out what this meant. And it, it's a – exactly as you said, a theoretical attack. I would say – you don't want to hand your RSA secure ID token to, you know, bad guys um, and let them pound away on it for a few weeks. That would that would be an unwise thing to do. Although it's not like they can get anything from it. They, they have to have a specific target that they're using it to crack. So, you know, it does mean you want to keep your your tokens close to you. Because, I mean, because, you know, this stuff does go from theoretical to real. I mean, you know, you can imagine the NSA is probably drooling in some lab somewhere. It's like, oh, goody, you know, we, now we have a way of, of hacking these things more quickly. Or, you know, and, and who knows what, what access they may have or tokens they may have acquired over time that they haven't been able to crack. Now this technology lets them do that. So, so this is the kind of thing that certainly has real world application yet yet it's it's not you know it it, it does it, it represents more of a policy failure throughout the entire crypto industry than it does anything else it's just like well you know sure the academics are poking away um but that's what they do um now this surprise people by by bringing 
bringing the attacks down into the mere hundreds of thousands from the millions, uh, you know, making it orders of magnitude faster. And suddenly it becomes it becomes real. So anyway, that's what that was about. Um, And this is I mean, this is what we see over and over and over. This is probably needs just needs to be regarded as the process. This is the process. That, uh, that the crypto industry has, the sort of that tension that exists between the academics that design these things and then tear them down and the commercial side that wants to profit from them and is in never in a big hurry to, to you know, need all the old tokens obsoleted. They'd rather, you know, not have to replace them all. So every so often they have to. I, and, use, you know, uh, I use Google Authenticator, which is a software-based... Uh program does the same thing and i'm trying to i don't maybe you would understand this i don't understand it but uh, i'm trying to figure out what google authenticator uses it says one-time passcodes are generated using open standards developed by the initiative for open authentication the hotp yeah it's OAuth. Yes. using hmac based one-time password and time-based one-time password but then it points to an rfc so i can't tell if it's using yeah. Um, so this is, I mean, then this, this is very much the same thing that, for example, some of the YubiKey modes right. are, um, and it's you know it's the 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 dongle that we talked about early on, the little football that, that PayPal and eBay were using. I, mean, I still have mine and use mine constantly. Um, uh, th- that that's a that technology is not the subject of this because uh-huh. this is more the the so the, the so called HSM the hardware security module one thing was really interesting was that all these these academics attacked relatively lightweight crypto solutions like these tokens not the actual industry strength hardware security modules why because they couldn't afford any of those right you know right. those cost tw- tens of tens and right. twenties of thousands of dollars, so they're much pricier. So you know, but but they probably have the same problem. But the good news is our little our little one time password systems are they're almost too dumb to succumb to this problem. <laughs> you you have to have a lot more of a crypto engine in there, something where you're you're giving it work to do and it's performing crypto functions in a black box mode and then telling you and then, and then giving you feedback. In fact, in one case, there's one company's product is still in debug mode where it dumps a log of oh. what happened. And so, oh. so the, I know. So, so it's like, thank you very much mm, for the debugging log. Yeah, handy. Yeah, made it much easier. So it doesn't look it. like this Google Authenticator does uh, no. use uh, that particular no. uh, technology. No. All, PKS, all it's doing is PKCS. it's either a it's either a counter or you know all of these things. You know, I, I've got the little VIP, the Verisign uh, right. uh, identity pr- uh, pro, uh, system. That's not vulnerable my, either. No, those just generate uh, a nice little key. In, in order for it to be vulnerable, you have to have a device where, where I mean, it's much more industry strength. You it. give it some work to do. It's got a crypto engine in it, and it actually performs the decryption for you and gives you a result. All of our little authentication technologies are just pseudo-random number generators. So, again, okay. not, not victim to this kind of problem. Excellent. I, uh, news. I picked up an interesting tidbit uh, that I actually forgot to add to my notes, but then I, re- I saw it again. I thought, oh, I just wanted to mention this. And, and uh, just as, a, as a, a, an indication of things to come, which I'm glad for, and that is the news yesterday that the FTC, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, has hit with a Wyndham Hotels chain with a lawsuit over three hacker breaches in the past two years. And so this the story reads, Wyndham Hotel Group just took the fourth blow in a quadruple whammy. First, it was hit with three digital breaches over two years that affected more than half a million customers. Now, the Federal Trade Commission has filed a lawsuit against the firm for allegedly misrepresenting the security measures that ought to have prevented those hacker intrusions. In a press statement Tuesday, the FTC claimed Wyndham had subjected consumers' data to, quote, an unfair and deceptive 
lack of protection that led to a series of breaches of Wyndham Hotels and those of three subsidiaries. The statement describes a series of three attacks on the hotel chain and its franchises um, beginning in 2008 that first compromised 500,000 credit card numbers stored by the firm, followed by attacks that breached another 50,000 and 69,000 accounts at other locations. The commission claims that those breaches are the result of Wyndham's failure to properly use complex passwords, a network set up that didn't properly separate corporate and hotel systems, an improper software configuration that led to sensitive payment card information being stored without encryption. The FTC contrasts that lack of protection with Wyndham's privacy policy statements that claims to, quote, recognize the importance of protecting the privacy of individual individual specific personally identifiable information collected about guests, callers to our central reservation centers, visitors to our websites, and members participating in our loyalty programs, unquote, and promise to use and promise the use of strong encryption and firewalls. So I just, I, I saw that and I thought, ooh, good. You know, I mean, unfortunately, it's this kind of publicity that, that again, as I've often said, will end up being the motivation in the boardrooms of the, you know, the CEO to say to the CIO or CTO, okay, tell us this cannot happen to us. And they squirm around in their chair a little bit and say, oh, well, uh, you know, we, we need more money or time or, or whatever. So it's just good news that, yeah. um, that, that, that we have, um, you know, some oversight like this. And it's weird that's the Federal Trade Commission, but it's because Wyndham is not doing what they are saying that they're doing. And it's interesting. So, if they start suing people for this kind of stuff. Yes. That's very interesting. Yes. Um, I wanted to mention also that I had a just a fantastic experience uh, generating an SSL certificate last night. And you don't often hear someone saying that. <laughs> Never hear that. <laughs> no. And this is DigiCert, once again. Um, I was able, you know, I, I talked about them before when I switched GRC, when I dropped VeriSign, now owned by Symantec, like a hot rock, and switched over to DigiCert and was able to get a multi-domain EV certificate. I went through the whole extended validation process once. You know, GRC has the advantage of having been around for 20 plus years. So, you know, DMB knows about us and, and so forth. So it was easy to see, you know, we have established addresses and phone numbers and so forth. Um, but the certificate that I got had a couple extra slots in it because the, the, the unlike VeriSign that was going to charge me something like $1,300 per I was able to get a four-slot single certificate for $550 or something. So, I mean, radically more affordable. It's the thing that, that you know, I mean, I've wanted to have, of course, extended, uh, you know, an EV cert for a long time. I ought to have one. And finally, it was, it was my switch to DigiCert that enabled that. Well, as I'm, as I'm moving more and more toward, toward GRC being always HTTPS, I realized that the media server that we've got where all of the, the, the archive podcasts, for example, are stored, as well as the videos that I serve on, on, on the site, um, the media server didn't have an SSL certificate. So last night I thought, huh, you know, I, I wonder if I can actually make this happen. And so I went back to DigiCert, logged in, uh, they found my, my account and it said, oh, you have two free empty slots. And I said, oh, that is just too cool. So I went over to the server, the, the media server, had it generate a, a so-called uh, 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 a certificate signing request, a CSR, dropped that onto the website, pressed the button. It took maybe about five minutes for them to verify everything, see that everything was current and correct. And it was only because I was adding a subdomain to GRC that I was that this was an automated process. So, for example, I have www 
www.grc.com and grc.com. Those are the two out of the four slots I had filled. Now I have media.grc.com. And in like five minutes, I received email with the the uh, signed certificate that I dropped onto the server, and we now have SSL. So I, you know, I know this sounds like a commercial. I'm getting, of course, nothing from them, except I want to help them because they deserve it. I just, these guys rock. And I'm so glad that I made the switch to them. So that's Digicert, D-I-G-I-C-E-R-T. And uh, I just can't say enough good about them. Good. And while I'm saying good things, Leo. Yes. Uh, I just finished uh, Mark, our friend Mark Rusunovich's latest book. Um, his prior book was Zero Day, which I read and liked and talked about. Now, the bad news is, no one can get this yet. Mark said when I, when I finished uh, yesterday and wrote to him and said, okay, this was really fun. Um, in fact, what I loved about this, I was thinking of our podcast listeners. And I mean, I was depressed and chilled because I would recommend this when it's available. And it won't be until September. And I will remind people um, when it is. In fact, I'm going to see if we could get Mark to, to jump on and and talk to us oh, because that'd be great. this is this is absolutely true it's a, obviously a fictionalized account but this talks about Stuxnet and Dooku and it it's an adventure written around the same two central characters uh, Jeff and Daryl who he introduced in his first book Zero Day so we get we continue following them they're ex NSA and C and CIA but computer people sort of, you know, off who should not be out in the field, but they end up going out anyway. Um, but as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, OK, anybody who we want to explain how bad, <laughs> unfortunately bad things are with security, this is the book because it's very accessible. It's very readable. And, and Mark just lays out how how really how really sad the, the the current state of cyber warfare is. I mean, the fact that you know the, the the U.S. electrical grid may well already be infiltrated with malware. You know, I mean, here we're chuckling about you know apparently the U.S. and Iran with. Um, with the Olympic Games project having designed Stuxnet and managed to get it into the um, uh, the nuclear enrichment facilities in Iran, uh, and you know, and and just last week or the week before, I was saying, yes, well, you know, the joke may be on us because we're getting our chips from China that is in all of our networking gear. So you know, we hope that those aren't don't have any extra functions added to them. Anyway, th this book is Trojan Horse, not available for a few months, but I will let our listeners know when it is, and uh, and see if we can have Mark come on to talk to us about it. Because uh, again, it's it's a great book, but oh my goodness, as just a as a, I, I think our listeners will find it fascinating as a fictionalized account by somebody who really knows this stuff, um, and. An, an incredibly accurate portrayal of how sad things are right now. I mean, just, you, you know, you really just want to unplug. It's, it's <laughs> scary. Mark Rosinovich uh, is a Mike was originally with a company called Sysinternals. Microsoft acquired them. He's a programmer. Founded. Founded yeah, he, it. Yeah. He, he and Russ founded Sysinternals and uh, which, you know, generated the, some of the best windows utilities you bet. that have ever been created. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and then he now is a technical fellow at Microsoft, which is their their most uh, revered uh, slot. And, you know, turns out he can write, too. He's a technical fellow. Um, I promised a second uh, sort of surprising uh, Spinrite story last week about Spinrite's success in recovering solid state media, which we're beginning to see more and more because I've mentioned it. And so this is uh, Bill Murray in Wilmington, North Carolina, said, Hi, Steve. I'd like to share another Spinrite testimonial with you. I recently took a 7,000-mile motorcycle trip. 
how do you ride seven thousand miles <laughs> with a with, sore like, butt without running out of what <laughs> without running into some ocean oh, somewhere? Yeah. Well, he went across the country to and back. He went I around guess. In a yeah, yeah. He says I recently took a seven thousand mile motorcycle trip from North Carolina, where he's based, to visit Colorado, Utah, and Arizona. Okay, so he kind of made a big loop. During the trip, I was taking several hundred photos per day. Some were JPEGs taken with a point-and-shoot camera while on the move, and others were RAW, R-A-W, plus JPEGs from my Canon DSLR. Each evening, I was copying my camera cards to both my netbook, equipped with a 96-gig SSD drive, and to a 32-gig USB thumb drive, since I was quickly filling up my camera cards. Unfortunately, I soon ran out of space on both the netbook and my largest USB thumb drive. To conserve space, since the SSD was almost full, I began using only the USB thumb drive. After returning home, when I went to import the USB thumb drive photos into Adobe Lightroom, I discovered that three folders, three days worth of photos, were corrupt and unrecoverable. Remembering that you and Leo had previously discussed a testimonial during a previous Security Now podcast where someone used Spinrite to recover some flash media, I broke out my copy of Spinrite, which I had previously purchased to, re- to pre-test drives for my Windows home server. I proceeded to check the USB thumb drive. After completing the scan, to my amazement, I found it had recovered my photos in the corrupted photo in the corrupted folders it i had some recovery messages about not being able to relocate some files since they were marked system and hidden but it had worked like many others i want to thank you for providing this outstanding product also a huge thank you for the time and effort you put into the weekly security now podcast with leo laporte bill murray wilmington north carolina thank Thank you you, Bill. bill yeah that's nice yeah, so I will, you know, I've I've been uh, sort of for a while thinking, well, I wonder whether Spinrite's life is uh, coming to an end as our media stops spinning. But uh, although the name will be a little antiquated. You call it Flashrite. <laughs> it sure does. Do, well, and I actually understand why. Because, because the, all of this technology, they have controllers and they have error correction. And that Spinrite's forte is dealing with that problem with with error prone media. And in the same way that that we have problem with magnetic storage because they have basically they're always pushing the limit, trying to cram as much possible data into as small a space as possible, always making it just reliable enough. Similarly, they are putting, for example, in the case of MLC, multi-level storage or multi-level cell storage, they're, they're putting analog voltages into individual capacitors in these memories. And as those voltages drift, the bits they read back are not going to be the same. So they need error correction in order to recover from a known expected error rate. And that's where Spinrite lives, is dealing with those kinds of problems. So... It does look like we've got plenty of future left um, still. For <laughs> Good. I hate for you to starve. <laughs> and remember, you know, people have been using it for 20 years and uh, yeah. still going strong. So it does represent an investment for the future. There you go. Hey, we're going to take a break. When we come back, coddling, C-O-D-L, which is a solution to buffer bloat. Yes. Uh, we'll get to some description and updates on that with Steve Gibson. The man of the hour, the explainer in chief. But first, for you in IT, I got a message for you. Go to Assist, which I'm sure you're familiar with, has been updated with some brand new capabilities. If you haven't tried Go to Assist lately, which is, by the way, Go to Assist is the market leader in remote support. Lets you access up to eight systems at the same time. It lets you do unattended support. It is totally the dominant player in here. Which, in many cases, that would just be, you know, well, we'll leave well enough alone. We're doing fine. But no, 10 years down the road, every time Citrix uh, updates go to assist, it gets better and better. And you just kind of get it automatically. Now they've added a whole new feature set to go to assist. To the remote support model module, they've added monitoring. 
So if you're in IT or you're interested in becoming a managed services provider, a, a super IT provider, this is what you want to know about. So here's how it works. You put the go to assist crawler on your client's network. Uh, Russell did this to our uh, system. It goes out, it looks at all the hardware on the network, all the network attached devices, all the software, makes a complete inventory, and then you sit down and you set up the dashboards. Now, there are standard dashboards, but you can also customize them for uh, network performance, for hard drive capacity, for slowdowns, for print spooler issues, CPU, load averages, every, anything you could imagine you could set up a dashboard monitoring system for. You have alerts via email, text, or IM. Now, this is great because you're proactive. Now, instead of reacting to the client saying, hey, there's something wrong, it's for anything from we're at a toner cartridge to the network's not working, you'll know before the client calls, and that's so important. Proactive support. And then you fire up that remote support module, you fix it. You didn't even have to get up from your chair, and you are a support hero. This is so cool. I mean, I can't even go into all of the features of this. It's, it's very, very elegant, sophisticated, easy to use, but extremely powerful. You can even do support from an iPad. How about that? It works with everything. Mac, Windows, Linux, too. So give it a try. Here's the deal. Visit gotoassist.com. Click the Try It Free button. The promo code is security. Just one word. So click the promo code link when you try when you do the trial and do us a favor and type in security. Spell it right. S E C U R I T. There, I got it now. And uh, and you can try this free for 30 days, both the remote support module and the monitoring module. If you've tried it before and you haven't tried the new monitoring, you've got to give it a shot. You will be very impressed. It's going to turn you into a support hero. Turn you into the kind of support person you always wanted to be. Go to assist.com. Click the Try It Free button. Use the promo code SECURITY for 30 days of unlimited use. Absolutely free. And we thank the folks at Citrix, not only for supporting security now, but for making the best dang product out there and making it better all the time. They do not rest on their laurels. Steve, what is Coddle? Okay, so Coddle is the way you pronounce the name of what will end up probably being the buffer management management strategy, which ends up dominating the internet over time. Sadly, you know we all have devices which are probably using what's known as tail drop, which is the is the official term for if the buffer's full, throw away, and there's no room to put a packet. Well, what can we do? Throw it away. Um, so let, let's rewind a little bit and, and remember how we got here. Um, the, the fundamental, well, I mean, always understood problem with an autonomous packet routing network is, is the need for buffering. Because if you imagine like a lattice grid of, of nodes all connected to each other in a in a very complex topology where um, customers are located off of different of these nodes and they put their internet traffic onto a given node, that is to say a router, and it sends it to the next one, which sends it to the next one, which sends it to the next one. So you've got all this traffic moving, jumping from one router to the next as it goes from its source to its destination and back again. And, you know, if you do a, if you do like a trace route command, eh, the number of hops, as they're called, between routers, certainly it varies. But, uh, you know, we're used to seeing something like 13 to 17, something like that. And we've talked about how there, the so-called internet diameter, that is a diameter of a circle, is, of course, the, the, the two points that are the farthest possible away. Similarly, the diameter of the internet would be the two locations that have the largest number of routers between them so that the data has to go through that many hops. And there, were, there was a problem that the so-called TTL, the time to live, was originally set at a number that was at the time reasonable, 
maybe 16 or 32. Generally, programmers like powers of two. Um, but it turns out that as the Internet grew in size, more routers were added, and it was possible for an operating system to generate a packet that would never be able to make it to its destination because its time to live would expire before then. So, so because we've got all of this sort of this ebb and flow happening statistically, but without any, without any overall plan, just every sort of every packet for himself, it's necessary to buffer both packets coming into a router because they might be coming in from, from you know, like you might have five or six all arrive at once from different interfaces. And then you, you and then the router figures out which interfaces each one needs to go back out of. And you then need to put those in a queue so that, that is to say a buffer, so that they can move as soon as there's space available and time on the outgoing wire. So, so buffering has always been present. The problem, as we discussed it when we talked about buffer bloat in detail, is that, that there's been a tendency as the price of memory has fallen. Now I mean, there's just more and more RAM in these single chip processors that all of our consumer routers are based on. And it's, it's counterintuitive to a network engineer to think, wait a minute, I have a perfectly good packet here and I have free buffer space. Why should I drop it? I've got, I've got room for it. And the reason is there's a, a very subtle interplay between the overall efficiency of our protocols and time delay. Big buffers create a time delay where more data is, is coming in than is able to go out. I mean, anyone can, can, can you know, sort of think of the model of a funnel where if you, if you put a lot of stuff in the, in the wide open end of a funnel and it's going out slowly, well, the, the funnel itself captures the, the, the material that's trying to get out through the smaller opening and it holds it for a while. So any given grain of sand sits in this funnel queue waiting for its chance to finally get out of the funnel rather than if you were only pouring in sand at the rate it could flow out then the the delay through the funnel would be as as near to zero as it can be just you know the the the, the grain of sand's own passage through there wouldn't be a backlog so it's this backlog which represents a problem and backlogs form Anytime you have a transition from a high bandwidth connection to a lower bandwidth connection, if you are sending things in at the high bandwidth speed, they're, they're going to have to back up. They're, they're, they're going to backlog. So many, as we've discussed before, many strategies have been designed. In fact, it's, just, it's, it's an acronym soup of strategies. I mentioned tail drop, which is the dumb one. The dumbest one, which is buffer everything until when a new packet is comes in that needs to wait and there is no place for it, we just drop it. Now, our, again, as we've talked about packet switching, the way that works, it's inherently des in the design of the Internet to tolerate dropped packets. Routers are supposed to drop packets. And what's interesting is that's informational that actually, the dropping of a packet in transit indirectly sends information back to the sender because the recipient never receives the dropped packet, thus never acknowledges the receipt. And so the, the original protocol designers designed the Internet to function Assume with the with the, with the assumption of dropped packets and to deal with it, so so engineers that engineered larger buffers and and unfortunately these things chain. So if every router between here and there has a big buffer, 
then, you know, you can end up with many, many seconds required to get your data to transfer from one place to the other. And if we were only transferring big files, that wouldn't be such a problem. But, you know, you and I, Leo, are having a conversation in near real time over the Internet. It's kind of amazing. And so, you know, we don't want to have a grain of sand stuck in a funnel no. <laughs> where that's my voice trying to get to you. We want it. And, and so these deep buffers really do not help anybody. The, what we want is we want them to, to catch bursts. We want them to, to like, you know, like be a surprise. Oh, whoa, whoa, suddenly more came in than we were expecting. Well, you know, as long as it doesn't persist, as long as, we're, as, as, long as that was like a surprise event that will then quickly be removed that's fine. That's proper use of a buffer, but not something that just sits there full and clogged with sand running over the sides of the funnel because more is coming in all the time than is able to get out the other end. So the, the most popular solution is something called RED, R-E-D, which is the acronym for Random Early Detection. It's also been known as random early discard or random early drop. The idea there is we we don't wait to have no room because obviously we have no room. There's nowhere to put a, an incoming packet. Instead, as we begin filling up, we increase the probability of discarding packets even though we've got room. And counterintuitive as that is, you, you can imagine that, that that inherently causes the buffer to resist getting full. It's, you know, it's discarding things before it's got before it's actually full, because this is an acknowledgement of the truth that discarded packets send a message to their sender. Some, you know, the protocols are designed so that somebody that's sending things and and stops getting them acknowledged will go, oh, maybe I ought to slow down. And it's like, yes, that's what's the message we're trying to send you. Slow down. And and, you know, and so all these systems tend to throttle. The problem is that despite an amazing amount of industry being focused on this problem, as I said, acronym soup all kinds of, of, of solutions proposed. There has never been one that works across the board, is independent of bandwidth, is independent of round trip time, is independent of traffic type. Many of these things can be tuned for specific situations. If you knew that you that your bandwidth was such and such, if you knew that your typical round trip time was going to be something, if you knew whether you had bursty traffic or or more slow buffer, or if you knew you had UDP stuff or TCP, if you, you know, if you put all kinds of constraints on, then then anybody could carefully tune a a solution for a given set of traffic. The problem is we no, we no longer have homogeneous traffic. We have a heterogeneous traffic. We've got all kinds of bizarre stuff happening, you know, peaks and valleys, ram, you know, uh, widely ranging bandwidth. In fact, what's interesting is that the problem with residential buffer bloat is is largely called it's caused by Wi-Fi, and I think it was, I, I was I was watching Tom and I think it was Brian Brushwood was they were talking about Wi-Fi and maybe uh, you know and like grumbling. I, I think he was using some sort of um, non-Wi-Fi wireless yeah. to do some some uh, some uh, interacting with your studios yesterday, and he, and and he went off on a rant. <laughs> about how useless you know free Wi-Fi is in coffee shops or right, anything that right. it's just it's it and it's it horrible. turns out yeah it turns out that the reason that is is that what we can't see is that as you move your hands around your laptop as you rotate as people walk by the the instantaneous bandwidth between you and the hotspot 
is jumping up and down and changing, and it's doing that separately for all the people who are who are trying to use it at the same time. I mean, it's amazing it works at all. And so as a <laughs> consequence, it, it really doesn't work very well. So, so the challenge is, is huge. So the, the news is, and this is just amazing when you put it in the full context of how big a problem this has been, how intractable it has been, how the best minds in the industry have been focusing on this. In fact, even Van Jacobson, who is the co-designer of this solution, he, he gave a speech six years ago in 2006 and wrote a paper that never got published that was beginning to sniff at this, beginning to talk about this solution, but it just it never got adopted. Now, the other problem is one of scale because we have big iron routers, you know, like in level three and, you know, at AT&T, you know, with high speed fiber optics where the actual routing is done in silicon and we have low end, you know, blue box pieces of junk that cost $30 that run off of a wall wart, uh, you know, five volt power supply that have a, a low power chip barely running Linux in a consumer router. And the problem is the same. It's a, at a different scale, but but fundamentally nothing changes. And so, the, so the, what they were looking for was something that solved this entire this entire problem. So this was developed by Kathleen Nichols and Van Jacobson. Van Jacobson uh, is known for um, having come up with a a, a, a next generation flow control for TCP. It is, it's called the Jacob Van Jacobson's algorithm. And he is regarded as the guy who single-handedly saved the internet from collapse in the late 1980s and early 1990s. That is the first version of TCP we're no longer using and it, it would not have worked. We needed a better means of flow control. And it was Van Jacobson who came up with the algorithms everybody is using today. They're known Ta Tahoe and Reno. You probably heard those acronyms, uh, Leo. I've, I've been there, but I know. <laughs> those are, those are uh, some of the approaches used for congestion avoidance in TCP. So what Kathleen and, and, and Van Jacobson figured out how to do was – they they developed an algorithm which I'm going to describe to you, and it's 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 tricky, but it's one of the things that's so nice is that it absolutely fits the need. That is, it can run on a and and is actually running on Linux based home routers. The the Cero C E R O W R T does have CODL C O D E L the the CODL controlled delay buffer management in it now in, as, as, as an experimental platform. So CODL is parameterless. There's no knobs, as they put it, for operators, users, or implementers. There's nothing that needs to be adjusted. It doesn't. The same algorithm can run in a in a in a thirty dollar piece of plastic as runs you know, on huge, big iron where all the routing is being done in, in silicon um, at, at, at the high end. Same algorithm. Um, unlike many of the algorithms that have been proposed, as they, they phrase it, 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 treats, it treats good Q and bad Q differently. And by that, I mean it keeps the delays low while permitting bursts of traffic. So it's exactly as I said we want. Um, I, I need to make sure I, I, I use the right words and, and that I define these terms because a buffer is, the, is like the static container for the data. The queue is the actual lineup of the packets. So, so I'm going to try to make sure I, I use the right terminology here. So, so the queue is the present um, waiting li the list of waiting packets 
that are are lined up in a queue in the buffer waiting to be sent. Um, Coddle adapts to dynamically changing link rates with no impact on utilization. And that's one of its coolest factors. Um, there is a, there is a, a PDF which, um, which was published by uh, the ACM. Um, I, I'm trying to think, if you put, if you Google controlling Q delay, Leo, I think it's the first link that comes up, controlling Q delay, and same for our listeners, of course, if anyone is, in, is, is interested. There, there, there's a PDF and figure seven on, I think it's page 10, uh, looks like page nine of the PDF, um, shows how this is how this performs relative to the random early detection and the tail drop algorithms in the face of changing bandwidths and it's just it's spectacular what they have done and as important as anything else it is simple and efficient that is because it needs to run in an underpowered chip or be easily implementable in router silicon it's it's very important that it's not overly complex so what is different from this algorithm from all prior um, approaches, the, the, the general acronym is AQM, Active Q Management. For and, and that that that's the term that covers any approach of any sort for for trying to intercede in managing the Q, managing the 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 list of waiting packets that are sitting in a buffer, such that you you are able to respond to bursty traffic where at the same time you you discard and drop packets intelligently to send the messages to the existing algorithms that they need to throttle themselves. So what's what's extremely cool about this is that they maintain a a what, what they call a a single state variable which is the the length of time that a they, a packet has been in the queue, that is what, what they call the, the minimum queue length, but it's measured in, in milliseconds and, and having more resolution ends up being good for this. And that's generally easier to do these days. They use the term packet sojourn time um, as the, so, you know, the packets sojourn through the buffer. Um, and I'll just I'll abbreviate that PST uh, so that I'm not having to say it all the time. But but so 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 think of PST this packet sojourn time as the the length of time a packet sits in the in the buffer while it's in the queue moving forward as packets are sent out. So their algorithm is. And this is the result of extensive testing in all kinds of networking configurations. They have what they call their, their target acceptable um, PST. That is their, what they call the standing queue duration is five milliseconds. That's, that's just, that's the number, five milliseconds. So there, this, this coddle algorithm has as its target that that no packet will be in the queue longer than five milliseconds. That is within a, it, it's a little bit more flexible than that, within a maximum of 100 milliseconds, so one-tenth of a second, the queue has to have dropped to five milliseconds sometime within a hundred millisecond window. So this 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 so-called this PST is what the, is a minimum Q length that has to have occurred within a tenth of a second. When that PST, that packet sojourn time, has exceeded five milliseconds for at least one hundred milliseconds, then a packet is dropped. So even when the buffer's not full, but if if the length of time a packet has been in the buffer is 
has, has not dropped down to their target of five milliseconds any time within a hundred millisecond window, then they start discarding. Essentially, this sort of switches into a discarding mode and they and they drop the first packet. The next drop time, and this is, gets a little hairy, but I'll explain what this means in a second. The next drop time is decreased in inverse proportion <laughs> to the square root of the number of drops since the dropping state was entered. So the okay, more now, drops... Go ahead. Yes. What they, <laughs> <laughs> Get lost. The next drop time is decreased. The top, drop time is decreased. So that means the drop rate is increased um, in inverse proportion to the square root of the number of drops since it began dropping. What that means in practice is it accelerates. The, the faster, and, okay. Yes, it gets faster until it, until it gets back to its target of five milliseconds. And believe it or not, that's it. That's all there is to it. What this ends up doing is Coddle then acts from in engineering terms as what's called a closed loop servo system that gradually increases the frequency of dropping until the cue is controlled. And it turns out in, in packet switching theory, there's actually a well-known relationship of throughput to the probability of dropping so that dropping ends up helping your throughput. And they end up then, that they have on their site, um, and there's, a, there's an appendix re, uh, um, referred to in this PDF that where they post the pseudocode, because this is all public domain, obviously this will be, this will be an RFC, and, and you know, I imagine, I hope, that router vendors run to implement this, that that big router vendors like Cisco and so forth offer firmware updates, and even little router, you know, Linksys and 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 the Cisco Soho routers offer firmware to implement this because it turns out it is simple to do. Even even this inverse square root drop probability, it turns out that the inverse square root can be computed efficiently using only integer multiplication. So even that, it, you know, isn't going to cause any great problem. And the entire algorithm is implemented with just four variables. The, the first, uh, the, the, the time of the first um, drop, the, the time to drop the next packet, the count of the numbers dropped since going into the drop state, and then a just a boolean that says whether we are currently dropping or not, and so it is really simple to do this. It's I mean it's no more complex than statistically dropping at a probability based on how large the how long the queue is, which is the RED, the random early drop or or, or detection approach. Um, it is it is simple to do. In their paper, they demonstrate exactly. This Wi-Fi nightmare of of rapidly changing bandwidths, and for example, they start off at time zero with a hundred megabit channel, then they drop it to it by by to one tenth of that to ten megabits, um, then again by by a factor of ten to one megabit, and then jump it up to fifty, and then up to one megabit, and then down to ten again, and they show for all of those changes. What Coddle does uh, versus what the standard buffer management of either random early detection or tail drop does, and it's just it's shocking how well Coddle performs. It very quickly adapts. It responds to the change, and and th this little this closed loop servo that I described drops just I mean intelligently starts dropping to make to keep the the overall delay through the buffer short, yet also signaling in an optimal fashion to any TCP traffic that is going through that it needs to slow itself down. And, and the consequence is essentially 
we have after decades of 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 trying we've got this problem solved yeah except you can't only get it in one router yeah nobody has it yet <laughs> <laughs> And I doubt this is the kind of thing you can do in firm. Maybe can you could you do it in firmware and update? Oh, absolutely, exist? you could. So it's just Ab software. Yeah, absolutely, just right now. Yeah, right now, firmware is maintaining it probably in a brain dead fashion. Just right. you know, just having a buffer, and it's probably huge. It's probably you know. So the fact that they've probably, got these giant buffers because they have so much RAM is controlled by firmware, so you can change how this works. Exactly. Even if you have all the hardware, you, you don't have to use it. And that's the, that's been the problem is that our own our Soho buffers in our Soho routers they they now have buffers that are multiple seconds long in terms of our upstream bandwidth. So when when we're when we're um, uploading something or or trying to play uh, like a game while somebody else is doing something in terms of bulk bandwidth transit, suddenly all of your interactivity, all of the game uh, interactivity just disappears because this, this even though it's well-meaning, this Soho buffer fills up and it's several seconds of delay. Well, the, the, you know, the bulk transit, the data being moved doesn't care but somebody who's trying to do an interactive online game, it just comes to a stop. Because, I mean, several seconds. Think about that. I mean, you know, you and I could not be having a conversation. We've all, you know, seen newscasters, you know, trying to talk to somebody via a satellite delay. And, I mean, you have to have some skill in order to, like, control yourself and, and, and wait for that satellite delay and manage that kind of delay. It's really difficult when you want to be interactive and, and operating in real time. So, so what they've got is something with minimal processing, minimal state. You know, the, one of the things that they're very proud of is that they only need to track the, the minimum delay through the buffer. They do not need the average. And that's significant. That's a big because difference. Because, yeah. yes, in terms of computation, to do the average, you need to add up all the delays and divide by the number of packets. To do the minimum, all you need to do is, is, is see um, what the, the timestamp of the packet as you're removing it is. And that's how long that guy's been there. And then you 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 maintain the smallest one you've seen with with a within a window of a hundred milliseconds. And if that ever if that's never down at your target of five milliseconds, any time during a, a tenth of a second, then you kick into beginning to discard and you increase the rate that you're discarding until you bring it down. So it 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 has a it's got some state in it. It kind of switches into an oak. You know, we need to start signaling to the people who are using this buffer that they need to back off, and and it does it in a way that just seamlessly fits with the internet's protocols. So, you know, having this is the first step: getting it ratified, getting the word out, and getting it then moved into firmware. Um, gives us some hope that we're going to get this buffer bloat problem solved. But users can keep an eye on firmware for their own routers. Because remember, the problem we have is where we go from high bandwidth to low bandwidth. That's the choke point, that funnel problem. And all home networks have, you know, 100 megabit local networks suddenly squeezing into a 2 megabit uplink through a DSL or, or, or cable modem that's where their buffers fill up. And so that's where we need this problem. And, and what would happen is this would then provide signaling back to the machines in the network to slow down in order to, to allow you, the residential buffer to stay real time, yet actually m increasing the overall throughput, counterintuitive as that is. They, they show charts where they show the throughput under these varying conditions – even though they're discarding intelligently and it's right up at between 90 and 100%, whereas the traditional algorithms collapse down in, into the low tens of percent of overall throughput. It's just, it's fantastic. Steve Gibson explains all.
And now if we can only get the router guys to put it in, we'll be good. We'd be good. If you want to uh, follow along in the transcript, a couple of people instead of the chat room, I'm going to read this one. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, go to the website, grc.com. That's where Steve lives. He puts transcripts and 16 kilobit versions of the show, audio versions of the show uh, there every week. Uh, you can also get full video and audio versions at our site, twit.tv slash sn. Steve uh, will be answering questions next week, right? Well, will I? Oh, it's the 4th it's the, of July. Yeah. I don't know. Well, the memo I got said that... Take the that day you off? Guys, you're gonna, well, that we're not going to be pre-recording. That's a shock. I know. <laughs> do, you, do you want to do a pre-recording? I can check. I'll, I'll check. I'll check with the yeah. people. I'll check with the people. I, I, Okay. Oh, but you're right. It is the Fourth of July next Wednesday, isn't it? It's so, Fourth of uh, July. Um, I had assumed we would we would find some other time to record, but I got a note saying, "Nope, there will be no pre-recording of podcasts." I was like, oh. "Lisa's trying to protect me." <laughs> I, that's exactly. It, it did come. It did come from Lisa. Yeah. She's very aggressively protecting my time, <laughs> but uh, but she doesn't understand that this show must go on. Uh, we don't I'm miss happy. episodes of this show. I'm, we never have. Never have. No. Uh, let me let me check, and I'll get back to you. But meanwhile. If you have a question, if it's this week or next, go to securitynow.com slash feedback and fill out the feedback form. Yes. We will do a Q&A episode in our next episode, which is unknown when that will be. Uh, and, of course, there's lots of other good stuff there, not just Spinrite, the world's finest hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. You must have it. But it also, works. It works, even on SSDs. But also uh, lots of other great stuff that Steve gives away for free because he's just a nice person. GRC, Gibson Research Corporation, grc.com. You can follow Steve on Twitter at SGGRC. He's also got some other, uh, he's got a VLC for the very low carb, SGVLC. He's got SG Pad for the pads. I'm hoping we're going to get one of these new um, Nexus tablets in here. And we can the Nexus take a 7, look at that. Yes. Yeah, it looks pretty sweet. We'll yeah. have uh, details on that. Uh, thank you, Steve. And um, I'll, uh, st you know what, folks, go to the calendar at twit.tv and uh, it will have whatever the next recording is will be on the calendar. And anybody who's following me on Twitter, when I know what the oh, story is, I, I will tweet it and let people know. Very good. Thank you, Steve. Th Steve Gibson. Thanks, Leo. Have a great day. We'll be back next time. Unknown when, but next time. <laughs> Security now. Security Bye. Now.